Before their departure, the Mandan chiefs informed Lewis and Clark of what lay ahead. A giant waterfall, followed by shining mountains. When the Corps of Discovery left Fort Mandan, they were now entering completely uncharted territory. Lewis and Clark continued to map out new areas as they progressed, as well as documenting new discoveries such as landmarks and rivers. They even encountered massive grizzly bears for the first time when they reached what is now Montana. The Missouri River seemed to go on forever, and the expedition reached an unexpected fork. After a brief debate as to which direction to take, Lewis and Clark decide to go left. Upon reaching the Great Falls, Lewis and Clark knew they went the right way. Here, the Corps encounters the first of their two most physically demanding challenges. There's more than one waterfall, and the Corps will have to find a route around all of them by land. How will they do this while carrying all that equipment? Sergeant Patrick Gass, the expedition's carpenter, is tasked to help the Corps build several carts to carry everything around these waterfalls. Lewis and Clark hoped that this 20-mile portion of the journey would take two days. Unfortunately, this part of the journey ended up taking over an exhausting month thanks to cart breakdowns, inclement weather, and rough terrain. The expedition did not yet have any horses, so those carts had to be pushed by hand the entire way. Lewis and Clark's greatest disappointment came in August 1805. Lewis believed that once he reached the Continental Divide, he would find the fabled Northwest Passage and achieve the expedition's primary objective. Lewis instead discovered that there is no waterway, just more mountains. Regardless, time was ticking to reach the Pacific, and the expedition had to press on. On August 13th, the expedition finally made contact with a Shoshone tribe. Unlike the Teton Sioux or the Mandans, the Shoshones were poorer and more oppressed, suffering constant raids from other tribes like the Blackfeet and the Atsinas. It's commendable that the Shoshones agreed to help the expedition despite not being as wealthy. Here was Sacagawea's time to shine. Lewis and Clark negotiated with a Shoshone chief for the horses they desperately needed to cross the Rocky Mountains, and with Sacagawea's help interpreting, they were successful. Chief One Who Never Walks gave the expedition 29 horses and a mule. Sacagawea was even reunited with her long-lost brother, Kameawait, whom she had not seen since she was kidnapped by the Hidatsas when she was younger. September 1805. Here came the expedition's second greatest challenge, crossing the Bitterroot Mountains using the Lolo Trail. Even with horses and the help of a Shoshone guide, passing through the Bitterroots would not be easy. According to Sergeant Patrick Gass, they were the most terrible mountains that I ever beheld. Through the bitter roots they went, and along the way they got lost, suffered freezing cold temperatures and frostbite, and nearly starved to death. What they thought would be an easy passage turned out to be an agonizing 11-day, almost 200-mile stretch. Want to add insult to injury? On September the 10th, the expedition was told of a shortcut they didn't know existed. An old Indian trail just above the Great Falls. What would have taken them only four to five days to cross before, took them over 50. One can only imagine how the members of the expedition felt when they found that out. Starving and extremely weakened, the expedition finally made it through the bitter roots and encountered the Nimipu tribe. 
Here is another noteworthy moment when the core would be saved by a woman. The Nimipu originally considered killing the expedition. However, a Nimipu woman named Watkuis said they should live, since she was treated kindly by the white folks when she was their captive years ago. Thanks to Watkuis' intervention, they were spared, and the Corps was allowed to rest and recuperate before continuing. In October 1805, with five new dugout canoes, the expedition progressed through the Clearwater River to the Columbia River and noticed another drastic change in terrain. They emerged from desert, grasslands, and dry air to lush forests and dense moisture. Near the end of October, the Corps of Discovery was now less than 200 miles from the Pacific Ocean. Further down the Columbia, seabirds were spotted and the air began to smell salty. They knew they were close. Lewis and Clark thought they found the Pacific Ocean on November the 7th, but this was another false alarm, instead finding a large bay where inclement weather trapped them for three weeks. On November 18th, William Clark was able to leave the campsite, climb up a hill, and finally spot the Pacific Ocean. After all the efforts it took to get there, Lewis and Clark had finally arrived. But there wasn't much time for celebration. The winter of 1805 was fast approaching, and they needed to figure out a place to stay. Instead of Lewis and Clark simply issuing an order, every member of the Corps was given the opportunity to vote on what to do, including Sacagawea and York. The decision was made to stay on the south side of the Columbia River. They spent that winter in Fort Clatsop, where they experienced constant cold rains. At least there was plenty of elk available to eat. The expedition stayed at Fort Clatsop around five months, and in March of 1806, it was finally time to head back home. 